Hey everyone, and welcome back for another deep dive with us. You know, today we're going to be tackling something. It's a topic that's super fascinating, but also kind of uncomfortable to think about. We're talking about in-groups and out-groups. Yeah. Have you ever felt that pull, that pull of us versus them? Oh yeah, for sure. Well, it turns out we're all hardwired for it. And today we're going to unpack why that is. Absolutely. And you know what? We have a fantastic guide to help us navigate this topic. It can be a little bit tricky, right? Yeah. We're going to be looking at this insightful article from Psychology Today. It was written by Dr. Fabiana Franco, a clinical psychologist. And the article is called In-Group and Out-Group Dynamics, a psychological perspective. Catchy title. It's full of really thought-provoking ideas. Yeah, it is. And w one of the first things that really jumped out at me was this idea that our need to belong, to belong to a group. That's actually a survival instinct, like going way back to our cave dwelling ancestors. Think back then sticking to them at safety in numbers, right? All right? Sharing resources. It literally helped us survive. Exactly. Back then it was crucial for protection against predators and just as importantly for sharing those vital resources like food and shelter. Oh, right. But here's the thing. Even though we're not facing those same threats today, like, we don't have to worry about saber-toothed tigers anymore. Yeah. That primal drive to belong is still a really powerful force in our lives. Okay, so fast forward to today. We're not worried about saber-toothed tigers anymore, but this need to belong is still playing out. Like, it's playing out in all sorts of ways in our lives. Think about it. How passionate people get about their favorite sports teams. Or how loyal they are to certain brands. It's like that ancient wiring is still there influencing us. Even in the modern world. Wow. We're constantly looking for groups to identify with. It could be anything. Online communities, political affiliations, even just our circle of friends. It's true. And this brings us to another key concept that Dr. Franco highlights in the article. It's called social identity theory. And I'll be honest, when I first read about it, kind of glazed over a little bit. Sounds a little jargony. Yeah, it does. But then I realized... Wait a minute, this is actually really relevant to my own life and probably to yours too. Oh, absolutely. And <laughs> once you kind of break it down, it's actually pretty straightforward. The basic idea is that our group memberships, they become a part of our identity. It's not just that we belong to a certain group. It's that being a part of that group actually shapes how we see ourselves and how we see the world around us. That's really interesting. So let's say you're really into a certain type of music. Okay. Does that mean your taste in music is actually shaping your identity? Absolutely. I mean, think about it. You might start to see yourself as someone who's like alternative or mainstream. Yeah. Based on what kind of music you like, you might gravitate towards other people who share your musical taste. And so in a way, your music becomes a way of expressing who you are and connecting with others. I like that. So it's like a shared identity. Yeah. Now that leads us to another fascinating point from Dr. Franco's article, something called the quest for positive distinctiveness. I know that sounds a little bit academic, but bear with me here. It's actually pretty relatable, especially if you've ever like found yourself in a heated debate about, say, coffee versus tea. Oh, yeah. I'm a coffee person myself. Oh, me too. Definitely. Okay, good. But we all want to feel good about the groups we belong to. For sure. We want to see our group as special as being better than other groups in some way. Okay, so it's not really about the coffee or the tea. It's about feeling like your group, like yeah. the coffee lovers yes. or the tea drinkers. Like your group is the best. Precisely. And that desire for our group to stand out, ah. to be positively distinct, that can actually drive all sorts of behaviors ah. from the clothes we wear to the opinions we express. That's so interesting. Okay, this is starting to make a lot of sense. But if we're always striving for our group to be the best, doesn't that naturally lead to some tension and conflict with other groups? That's where things can get a little bit tricky. Yeah. And to really understand why, we need to go back to those evolutionary roots we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. Remember back in the day, being suspicious of other groups was actually a survival strategy. They might be competing for the same resources or even pose a direct threat. So you're saying that ancient us versus them wiring is still lurking somewhere in our brains. It's more than just lurking. It's actively influencing our perceptions and our interactions <laughs> with people from different backgrounds, different cultures, or even those who simply hold different opinions from our own. Wow. Even if it's not a life or death situation anymore, that ancient part of our brain is still there. And it makes us instinctively wary of those we perceive as 
outsiders. You know, this is starting to sound a little bleak. Are we doomed to be divided by these ancient instincts forever? Well, not necessarily. But to understand how we can overcome these divisions, we need to dig a little deeper into the psychological tricks that our brains are playing on us. Oh boy. Dr. Franco dives into some fascinating cognitive biases that further solidify those in-group and out-group boundaries in our minds. And trust me, once you start noticing these biases, you'll see them everywhere. Okay, I'm all ears. What kind of mental gymnastics are we talking about here? Let's start with one you've probably heard of, confirmation bias. It's that sneaky tendency we have to favor information that confirms our existing beliefs. Oh yeah, I'm definitely guilty of that. It's like when I find a news article that supports my political views, I'm all over it. But if it challenges my perspective, I just swipe left. Exactly. And here's where it gets really interesting. In terms of in-groups and out-groups, if you already believe that your political party is the only one with the right answers, confirmation bias makes you more likely to seek out sources that reinforce that belief. And then on the flip side, you might dismiss opposing viewpoints as uninformed or biased without really even considering them. So it's not just about liking a certain type of music or coffee. Confirmation bias can actually impact how we consume information and how we form opinions about important issues. Absolutely. And mm. the bias can be even more pronounced. Yeah. When we're dealing with strong group affiliations, we become less likely to question information that supports our in-group's perspective, even if that information is inaccurate or incomplete. Okay, I'm starting to see how this plays out in real life. Yeah. Now, what about the outgroup homogeneity effect? Dr. Franco mentioned that one too, and it sounds a bit ominous. Yeah, this one is subtle, but it's incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. It's the tendency to see members of our in-group as unique individuals with you know, diverse personalities and opinions. Right. But when it comes to an outgroup, we tend to see them as this kind of homogenous blob. A blob. Yeah, we assume they all think and act alike, which of course is really true in reality. So we see all the nuances and complexities within our own group, okay. but everyone outside of that group is just a stereotype. It's a recipe for misunderstanding and prejudice. I mean, think oh. about it. If you believe that everyone in a particular political party thinks the same way, you're much less likely to engage in meaningful conversation with someone from that party. You've already written them off as having this monolithic viewpoint. Yeah. You know, it's funny because... Now that you mention it, I can see how easily I do this sometimes. Like, I might assume that everyone who supports a certain political candidate must agree with all of their policies. But in reality, people's motivations and beliefs are way more complex than that. Exactly. Every, everyone has their own unique set of experiences, values and priorities that shape their perspectives. And reducing an entire group to a stereotype just completely ignores that complexity. Okay, wow. I'm starting to feel like my brain is playing all sorts of tricks on me. But Dr. Franco didn't just leave us in a pit of despair, right? There's got to be a way to overcome these biases. Don't worry, she offers some hope. And a lot of it boils down to simple practical steps we can all take. The first, and perhaps most important, is awareness. We've already done some of that just now by talking about these biases. But recognizing these thought patterns in ourselves is crucial. So like catching myself when I'm scrolling through social media no. and I'm only liking posts that confirm my existing beliefs or when I find myself making these sweeping generalizations about a whole group of people. <laughs> exactly. It's about being mindful of those knee jerk reactions and challenging our own assumptions. But awareness is just the beginning, right? What do we do once we've identified those biased thought patterns? How do we actually change them? One powerful strategy Dr. Franco suggests is actively seeking out diverse perspectives. Instead of just staying in our comfortable echo chambers where everyone agrees with us all the time, we need to expose ourselves to viewpoints that challenge our own. So instead of just reading news sources that align with my political views, I should also seek out articles that present a different perspective, even if it makes me a little uncomfortable. That's the idea. It's about expanding our horizons and realizing that there's more than one way to see the world. You know, it's like that saying, walk a mile in someone else's shoes. But in today's digital world, it's more like scroll through someone else's Twitter feed. Exactly. And it's not just about passively consuming information either. It's about engaging in respectful dialogue with people who hold different views. Yeah. Dr. Franco really emphasizes the importance of fostering empathy, which is the ability to understand and share the feelings of others. Empathy. It's another one of those words that gets thrown around a lot. But what does it actually look like in practice? How do we cultivate empathy, especially when it comes to people we perceive as being in the out group? You know, it starts with remembering that everyone, regardless of their group affiliations, is a complex human being with their own unique experiences, values and motivations. 
just like you. Okay, so instead of seeing someone as just a representative of a certain political party yeah, or social group, I should try to see them as an individual with their own story. Exactly. It's about trying to understand their perspective, even if you don't agree with it. Listening with an open mind, asking questions instead of jumping to conclusions. That sounds simple enough, but I imagine it can be pretty challenging in practice, especially in today's polarized climate, where it seems like everyone is digging in their heels and clinging to their own beliefs. It definitely takes effort, but even small acts of empathy can make a difference. And one of the most powerful ways to cultivate empathy and to challenge those outgroup homogeneity perceptions is through face-to-face -face interactions. So putting down our phones and actually having a conversation with someone, novel idea. As simple as it sounds, there's something about those in-person encounters that breaks down barriers mm. and humanizes people in a way that online interactions just can't replicate. Think about it when you're talking to someone face-to-face. -face. You're picking up on their body language, their tone of voice, their facial expressions. You're seeing them as a whole person, not just a profile picture or a username. You know, I'm thinking back to Dr. Franco's point about the bowling alone phenomenon. It's not just about in-groups and out-groups. It's about the fact that we're increasingly isolated from broader social connections in general. That's a great point. And maybe part of the solution is simply getting out there and interacting with people from diverse backgrounds in real-life settings. It could be joining a club, volunteering in your community, or even just striking up a conversation with someone you wouldn't normally talk to. It's about expanding our social circles beyond just those who look, think, and act like us. And that brings us to another strategy Dr. Franco highlights, promoting cross-group interactions, especially in settings where people are working towards a common goal. This is where things get really interesting. Think about those classic team building exercises where people from different departments have to work together to solve a problem. As cheesy as those activities can be, there's actually a lot of research to back up their effectiveness. So putting people from different backgrounds together and giving them a shared purpose can actually help break down those in-group, out-group barriers. Absolutely. When people collaborate on a shared project, they start to see each other as individuals, yeah. not just representatives of their group. They recognize their shared humanity and often discover that they have more in common than they initially thought. It's about finding that common ground, that shared purpose that transcends our differences. And that's a pretty powerful thing. You know, as we wrap up our deep dive into in-groups and out-groups, I'm really struck by how much our brains are working against us here. It's like they're constantly pushing us towards those us versus them categories. Yeah, it's true. Our brains are wired to categorize and simplify the world around us, which, you know, can be helpful in a lot of ways. Yeah. But when it comes to social groups, those shortcuts can lead to some pretty harmful biases. Right. But here's the good news. And I think this is what Dr. Franco was ultimately getting at in her article. We're not slaves to those ancient instincts. We actually have the power to choose awareness over ignorance, empathy over apathy, and connection over division. That's a really powerful way to put it. And I think the more we understand these underlying psychological dynamics, the better equipped we'll be to make those conscious choices. Exactly. And, you know, we've talked about a lot of strategies for bridging those divides today, like challenging our own biases, seeking out diverse perspectives, engaging in meaningful dialogue and fostering empathy through face to face interactions. Oh, right. And let's not forget the importance of challenging stereotypes whenever we encounter them, whether it's in casual conversation or media portrayals or even our own internal thoughts. Speaking up against those harmful generalizations can really make a difference. It's about shifting the narrative one conversation at a time. But what does that look like in practice? Can you give me like a concrete example? Sure. Imagine you're at a social gathering and someone makes a sweeping generalization about a particular group of people, maybe based on their political affiliation or religious beliefs. Instead of just letting it slide, mm. you could gently challenge that statement. You could say something like, you know, I've met people from that group who hold a variety of different viewpoints. It's not really fair to paint them all with the same brush, don't you think? I love that. It's not about being confrontational or starting an argument. It's about respectfully offering a different perspective mm -hmm. and reminding people that groups are made up of individuals, not stereotypes. Exactly. And sometimes the most powerful thing we can do is simply share our own experiences. So if someone expresses a prejudiced view, we can counter it by saying something like, my experience has been different. I've found that. Mm. And then you can share a personal anecdote that challenges their assumptions. 
It's about humanizing the other and making those abstract group categories feel more real and relatable. Yeah, I'm feeling a lot more hopeful after this conversation, but I'm also realizing that, you know, this is ongoing work. It's not like we can just check a few boxes and suddenly all of our in-group, out-group biases will magically disappear. You're absolutely right. It's a lifelong journey of self-reflection, education, and conscious effort. But the good news is that every step we take in the right direction, no matter how small, brings us closer to a more inclusive and understanding world. Well said. So as we wrap up this deep dive, I want to leave you with a final thought. What's one small step you can take this week to challenge your own biases and build a bridge with someone you might perceive as an out-group member? Maybe it's striking up a conversation with someone new or seeking out a different perspective on a hot button issue or simply noticing those moments when you're lumping people into categories. Yeah. Remember building a more inclusive and understanding world. It starts with each of us. That's a great point. Well, thanks for joining us on this deep dive into the fascinating and often challenging world of in-groups and out-groups. Keep questioning, keep connecting, and keep diving deep.